Thank you, everybody, for <coughs> coming this evening and braving the snow. Uh, I, I thought maybe we should cancel the day because of the snow and because our uh, uh, slated speaker, uh, Professor Trivoletti, developed a flu last night and called in uh, sick. And so I, I got up at three this morning to put a few notes together and called on my friend uh, Claudius Austin to do likewise. Uh, and so I'll introduce uh, Dr. Austin later. <coughs> but um, in, um, in the, this is the Gary Sungamalia <coughs> Foundation slash Edwards Danlos Society group meeting tonight. <coughs> and uh, we have distinguished members from Hopkins uh, in the back and also uh, George Washington University. The, uh, but uh, within the uh, Kiari Ehlers Danlos community of patients, certainly the ones I see, probably 50% have movement disorders. This is really a, a huge problem, you know, certainly for me. And uh, these movement disorders span the full gamut from mild tremors that may, as Dr. Rowe believes, be simply related to the increased adrenaline levels, all the way to generalized tonic-tonic seizures. And whether they're all related on the same spectrum or whether uh, they have unrelated uh, etiologies, I'm not, I'm not certain. But I thought it's something we really need to discuss and come to terms with. Dr. Trifoletti has been working a lot with pandas and Lyme's disease and some of the perineoplastic limbic encephalitides. And so I'm going to give an overview of those this evening and then Dr. Austin is going to discuss treatment. And he's, over the years, he's developed a tremendous expertise and sensitivity to the treatment of dystonia. Uh, but the, uh, it really goes back to the 17th century when the notion that an infection could cause a behavior change and choreoform movements, when Thomas Sydenham made this, uh, you know, recognized this relationship in England and wrote about it. But the notion that the choreiform movements were tied to streptococcal antibodies was not discovered until the early 50s by Telemann, uh, Taranti and Stolomon. But strep infection remains the most common cause of choreiform movements even today, even though the incidence has decreased greatly in Northern Virginia, in Fairfax County, uh, Korea form movements and strep infections were responsible, well, strep infections were responsible for 1% of pediatric admissions to hospital in 1940, and that incidence has decreased to 0.2% in the 80s. I'm not sure what it is right now. But there's still large outbreaks in the, across the United States where there'll be a sudden burst in increased numbers of strep infections and uh, rheumatic fever and everything that goes with that. And one of the highest places, uh, one of the highest endemic regions is in the Northern Territory of Australia where I used to live, where 1% of the children have uh, um, strep infections and carry antibodies. And in fact, my own brother uh, had it. And um, so, uh, but it's not just strep that cause movement disorders. There are a number of bacteria. Uh, mycoplasma is the most common cause of pneumonia. Legionnaires, the second most common cause of pneumonia, cause movement disorders. Also salmonella, uh, staphylococcus, Lyme's disease, diphtheria, uh, and many viruses, uh, dengue fever. Uh, we have a patient uh, around right now who had two bouts of dengue fever and someone in the audience tonight who had uh, dengue fever. Uh, normally a, a mild viral illness, but in some people it can develop into the full-blown uh, encephalitis picture. Uh, cytomegaloviruses, enteroviruses, HIV, influenza, Japanese encephalitis, measles, rubella, varicella, chickenpox, West Nile, all cause uh, movement disorders but also parasites, and that's something we haven't been looking for, it's just a somus, but also tinea soli, a common tapeworm, can cause dystonia and hemifacial spasm and chorea. Uh, 
Now, uh, not only do infections cause movement disorders, but very small tumors in the body can cause uh, movement disorders. And these are known as the paraneoplastic limbic encephalitides because they're associated with small tumors, neoplasms, uh, although not all the time. Half the cases are not tumors, but probably infections. They affect the limbic system, which is kind of a uh, probably anatomically incorrect part of the brain, uh, in, in, incorrect description of a part of the brain that affects memory and behavior. At, at any rate, uh, these tumors generate antibodies that cause behavioral changes and psychosis and hallucinations and, uh, and uh, sleep disorders, catatonia, and movement disorders, and seizures that can be refractory to all treatment. So uh, the first um, idea that antibodies affected the brain came from Corcellus in 1960. He did a lot of work in the cerebellum and with autism. And then in the 1980s, they found uh, that the serum contained antibodies to non-central nervous system tumors that could, these antibodies could enter the central nervous system and cause behavioral changes. And it was only in the early, this century, in 2005, that they noticed four patients, four women, who uh, developed memory problems, acute uh, psychotic changes, decreased consciousness, autonomic changes, instability, hyperventilation. Uh, these uh, began as a viral-like prodrome and then gradually were followed by memory changes, behavior changes, psychosis, dyskinesias, dysautonomia, and uh, they were all found to have tumors. And that led to the discovery of the anti n methyl aspartate receptor uh, paraneoplastic limbic encephalitis. Everyone say that quickly three times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, the, the anti-NMDA uh, is the most common one of the, uh, of the paraneoplastic limbic encephalopathies, but there are a number of others and uh, which include voltage-gated calcium channels and AMP channels and antibody to LG1, antibody to HU, antibodies to GABA, antibodies to MA, MA2, uh, and antibodies to glutamic acid decarboxylase. We have a patient uh, that we diagnosed with that. <coughs> and um, the, uh, and, uh, uh, you've heard me talk about NMDA before, that NMDA can be uh, upregulated by trauma. Stretching a neuron causes increased NMDA receptors. And um, the, the NMDA is important in seizures, in learning, and an upregulation of NMDA receptors makes neurons more susceptible to hypoxia and nitrous oxide species. So the, uh, uh, one set of authors looked at the typical phenotype and they've now gathered 577 patients in North America and Spain, well, between 2007 and 2010 with this diagnosis, and 81% were women. Um, I, you know, I don't know if that's because they're the weaker species or what. Because they keep complaining. Um, actually, this is, this is probably the wrong audience <laughs> Right, I might need some help from you. Uh, 46% had teratomas. Uh, adults more, more likely to have behavioral changes. Uh, children more likely to have movement disorders. The, uh, the, uh, if you, the CSF was the best way to detect the serum antibody. Uh, now, 81% had favorable outcome, 12% had relapses uh, a year or two later. And uh, so that's just that uh, diagnosis of these paraneoplastic limbic encephalitides 
There's the clinical picture of the memory loss, the confusion, disorientation, agitation, sleep disturbance, depression, hallucination. Many of these patients are diagnosed with psychiatric illnesses. Uh, and 50% of the symptoms are extra limbic, They're not just from emotions, but there are other parts of the brain. The EEG will show vocal slowing, uh, sometimes epilepsy in the medial temporal lobes, uh, often no epileptogenic stimulus. Uh, uh, other times no epileptic discharges. The MRI uh, on a T2 weighted or a flare image will show signal, usually in the medial temporal lobes, but also sometimes in the brainstem and the cerebellum and uh, the glucose PET scans can show focal hypermetabolism uh, in the areas where there's degeneration uh, due to these antibodies. So these antibodies attach to the membranes of neurons and affect the receptors, or sometimes they attach to intranuclear, uh, intracytoplasmic uh, uh, sites and cause uh, the changes there. The, um, um, we have to look at the CSF to look for lymphocytes, what's called the lymphocytic pleocytosis, sometimes oligoclonal bands, which are also typical of multiple sclerosis. And um, we look for antibodies against all these antigens that I mentioned, also antibodies against uh, thyroid peroxidase and thyroglobulins. The, and then uh, to look for a tumor, you need to do a CT scan, an ultrasound, and beta human chorionic gonadotropin and alpha theta protein to look for testicular tumors in men. And mammography to look for small breast tumors. Now we're talking about very small tumors, and often these tumors never get big. They're just attacked by antibodies. They go away. You have to look for them, and the best outcomes occur when you remove the tumors. Uh, differential diagnosis for the paraneoplastic limbic encephalitis include a number of the viruses I mentioned, you know, herpes, HIV, Lyme, TB, Listeria, CMV, herpes virus 6, X, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, and fungi, Jakob Kruzfeld uh, virus, uh, Wernicke syndrome, I think we had one patient who developed, became very nutritionally depleted and then developed a thymine deficiency and developed a full-blown Wernicke syndrome with confusion, confabulation, psychosis. Uh, methotrexate, lithium, hepatouremic syndrome, Beckett's disease, we've had a few patients with Beckett's disease. They have Middle Eastern ancestry. <coughs> they have aptus ulcers in the mouth and pathetic responses to needles. You, stick them with a needle and they'd get a, a, almost an allergic response to that. And they have inflammatory changes in the brain. And gliomas and other CNS tumors. These are all things you need to think about uh, to rule out before making the diagnosis of a perineoplastic limbic encephalopathy. Now the treatment for these, uh, most important thing is to find a tumor, if there's one there, and remove it, or treat the infection. Uh, treat with methylprednisolone, one gram, IV per day for five days, and then IVIG 0.4 grams per kilogram over five days. If that doesn't work to a plasma exchange. If that's not successful, repeat it. If it is successful, then repeat again anyway at six weeks, and sometimes follow up with cyclophosphamide and rituximab. All right, let me finish with five things, uh, five practical things. Uh, that I think we have uh, learned over the last few years. Uh, there are actually six things that seem to make dystonias worse or to disinhibit them or bring them on. And one is uh, infection, uh, low glucose, low blood pressure, <coughs> trauma to the spinal cord or brainstem, such as uh, instability. Uh, opiates, uh, hyponatremia, uh, and other metabolic disorders, hypotension, and uh, antipsychotic drugs.
um, some of the, the neuroleptic drugs can uh, trigger dystonias. All right, well that's a very brief rendition of paraneoplastic lymphic encephalopathy. Uh, and uh, even briefer account of PANDAS. But I, I just wanted to uh, uh, bring those up for discussion and to get everyone thinking about them because they're a huge problem in the patients we see. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Claudius Austin, who I think is one of the <coughs> more brilliant uh, internists I've met, of course. You know, not as brilliant as you, or Claire, or, <laughs> <laughs> or Alan, or Peter. <laughs> One of the top five, anyway. <laughs> In this room. Uh, and uh, God, the, room, the room is so small. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, Austin has, or Claudius has really uh, developed a huge expertise in treating dystonias, and so he's going to discuss uh, treatment. Thanks. Thank you. Well, you don't learn about them in schools, and you don't have them in the manuals that um, internal medicine doctors or emergency room doctors study from. So from a patient perspective, you go something very bad happened to you or to your family and you go to the ER and they don't know us that. So what are you doing? And you go to your primary care and he doesn't know us that. One of the patients told me that the primary care just Googled the name in front of them because never heard of it. And uh, why you do that? Then you go to the internet and you go to forums and find little hospitals that, uh, that uh, have the luck to have um, Fraser Henderson that sees so many EDS and all of them of the most advanced one and then you realize that the EDS is not a disease, it's a spectrum. EDS is at the same time pandas and uh, um, dystonia and uh, mastocyte disorder and all together. We don't even know how to call them and how to quantify them. So we try to I mean, you, we try to make a bit of order in the chaos, but it's not easy. <coughs> we had a patient with PANDAS, which is a very successful story, that um, she had PANDAS as an adult, so that's not P, because P is from pediatrics in PANDAS, so an adult PANDAS, so to speak. And um, we tried to put some numbers in this disease to get a scale of obsessive compulsive disease called Y box, uh, Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale that can transform it in numbers. And it turns out that before she came, the, the scale goes to 40. It goes in eight, so one to zero to eight is nothing. Eight to 16 is mild. 16 to 24 and so on. So she, 32 to 40 is horrible. Her number was 36 when she came. I mean, she was very bad after three sessions of plasmapheresis that we did here, already the number was 26. And then we wanted to see what happens, how long does it last? Because normally if you do not have a new a streptococcal infection, let's say in two, two years, then you, you might be without any symptom or with very mild symptoms for that period. So what, we, what I would like to do in ideal world it's to get all the PANDAS patients, put all of them in the white box, and put, them, put some numbers. How long does the treatment last? Um, do we need to do prophylaxis with antibiotics? We don't know that. Do we have to um, get them every year and just give them um, a shot of uh, whatever, ceftriaxel or something, just to see what happens? So nobody nobody has funding or nobody has um, cases so many to do that so very very interesting um, I wish they told me before but I wish you told me before that the patient had pandas because I went home and I read all night long and the next day I went very triumphant I said I, I have no your diagnosis you have pandas she looked at me big deal I was told that before <laughs> yeah um, then there's a problem, and that applies to all of these, 
autoimmune encephalitis that we talked about. And the idea is your body makes those antibodies. You come here, I give you plasmapheresis, I remove the antibody. But then you go home and make new ones. That's not enough. You, I have to pretty much stop you from making those. And here, with, with the problem that we, I guess, we don't do still enough is that if steroids don't work or give a lot of other complication, we should try other drugs like methotrexate, azotioprine. We try that, but people with so many other surgeries and so many immunity problems are not, of course, keen to do that. The families of, of our um, EDS patients are encyclopedias. You better read and know what you talk because otherwise they will dwarf you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Then, and we like, I mean, we, after a few cases you got experience, you get experience, then you figure out if uh, this NMDA encephalitis, there's a very dramatic book, probably you read it, about of Susanna Cahill, Callahan, called Brain on Fire. This young girl who's a journalist in New York, she went to a lot of top hospitals and uh, she was called alcoholic, uh, um, schizophrenic, bipolar, and everything, uh, uh, malingering. Apparently she had those issues because she wanted attention and so on. Because none of those doctors knew. It's kind of ironic if she came to this little doctor community's hospital, she would have gotten diagnosed in the first attempt. Funny. Um, <coughs> We spec, I mean, I speculate that when somebody will write a book in the future on, on EDS, we will put there a chapter called, I don't know, EDS slash EPS, because there's some extra pyramidal movements in the EDS for sure. And I try to, to treat them like we would treat a Parkinson. And we had success with some medications like that. Then, um, my theory is actually that is an acetylcholine problem and you have to block that. That's why uh, if you take a medication that has that side effect, including a simple amitriptyline or hydroxyzine or cogentin, which is used in Parkinson, those movements improve a lot. Um, the NMDA encephalitis and PANDAS and the uh, Sinahem chorea, they, chorea, they all affect the same basal ganglia. They are somewhere in the bottom of the brain and they are inflamed and swollen by the MRI during the episodes. Normally the kids that have this chorea, uh, they get over it, they heal. And that thing not, never comes back. If it comes back, we don't call it chorea anymore. We call it pandas or adult pandas. Are they one and the same disease? No, but they are similar. And I think this is pretty easy to treat now compared to things that we've seen here. Um, how we treat them, how we treat an autoimmune disease and these, the name of um, paraneoplastic encephalitis is kind of a generic incorrect name because you can have those antibody even without having a neoplasm. You can have them without having a tumor that makes it makes them. Actually, probably in half of the cases, you do MRIs and scans and look for a tumor, you never find it. Um, in the case, for example, of the stiff man or stiff person syndrome, uh, uh, um, you find probably thymoma or tumor of thymus or in, only in a third of the cases, you have another version called autoimmune that goes together with other autoimmune diseases like diabetes type 1, um, vitiligo, um, thyroiditis. Just it comes like with a package and uh, the, you have only one option then. You take those antibody out. And what we do and everybody does, first you try prednisone. If that doesn't work, we will go to 
immunoglobulin, IVIG. If that doesn't work, we do five sessions of plasmapheresis. And we back to what I said before, then you have to stop bo the body from making it. And you put people on long-term uh, uh, immunosuppressive, like even rituximab, which is used in rheumatoid arthritis and other uh, diseases, might work. So all of these are things that we try, and it's by trial and error, because we don't know. We don't have guidelines, we don't have books. Um, and we'll see what happens. Sometimes it works beautifully, sometimes we fail miserably, and we think of something else. Um, then POTS. POTS is also somehow part of the EDS. We've seen horrible cases. We've seen cases of people uh, fainting 30 times a day. And uh, trying to put them to, the, it, looked like, uh, it looked like something called narcolepsy. We tried even those medication like um, ProVigil that keeps you vigil, you know, to see if they work. They didn't. Um, it's hard. It's hard because we have to go to trial and error. Um, so as, as a treatment, this is all we have. Now when you give one, we, do, we always start with the, with the, you know, the, less in, the, less, the least invasive one. And then if it doesn't work, we go one step further. But the idea is, and the beauty of the problem is because they always come back, especially in EDS, even if a disease ends, then something else will hit you. We can have a follow-up like other center can't. And this is all because of him. Well, thank you. panel in the back there? Or? <laughs> so when you have a... I said a question for you, not... No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, okay. Can I ask one and then I'll yes. answer? Um, so in the perineoplastic syndromes, when you remove the tumor, the symptoms will largely persist, right? Because you still need to remove the antibodies? Well, if you find the tumor remove it, the, the symptoms should go away. They should? They should. Okay over time. <coughs> well, how, how so does the plasmapheresis work? Um, that only works if the molecules that you want to remove are large enough, like more than 15 kilodaltons, and most of IgG are large enough. Then they have to last in your body more, the, the half time Plasmapheresis to work is the plasmapheresis should work faster than your own body clearing them. And this is the case, for example, in uh, myasthenia gravis, then they body last 21 days. So you don't want to keep those 21 days, oh, that's a half time, so that means they, the concentration drops to half in 21 days, but you still have a lot of thing there, and the body makes new. So. If you find a tumor and remove it, like a pinoma in, in this case, uh, then nobody makes new. You remove the, the existent ones and you also. But how many times we really find a tumor? First time I saw TPO, uh, thyroid peroxidase antibody, I said, oh, this is a Hashimoto thyroiditis. Oh, no way, no way. It turns out that 20% of normal people without any pathology have those. It turns out that you can have those without having any disease. So everything that's in those um, endocrinology books when it comes to antibody makes no sense. Yeah. So are PET scans effective to find these tumors? Or? Yeah, <coughs> PET scan and CT scan is a good combination. But increased metabolism somewhere in the body. So they, uh, it'll be more sensitive in picking up those tumors. And there's a lumbar function more effective than a blood test. Yes, yeah. Uh, CSF is more highly specific than the serum markers. The NMDA was 100% for CSF, 80% for serum. Yeah. Do you 
do you feel like the prognosis is, is there any difference in prognosis if there's a delay of time of treatment? Yeah, the prognosis is best for people who are diagnosed early. If you find the tumor early and remove it, if you institute the treatment, and it's best if you do the primary treatment, you know, the prednisone, the IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin, and then proceed to the secondary treatment, uh, like rituximab or cyclophosphamide or azathioprine. Those patients who go from primary to secondary treatment in sequence do the best with the early treatment, early diagnosis, early treatment. Do you think it's still worth trying if it's been going on for a couple of years? doesn't have already made the damage, but if you keep them there, they will continue to make it, so. Yeah. How common is it in patients with EDS to have this? It seems very common, it's kind of scary. Dr. Frank Meyer. I don't know. I think it depends on whom you ask. Yeah. Different I mean, opinions just in this room. Yeah. I'm sitting here wondering why is it more common than the EBS population anyway? You know, we know that people with the, uh, the hereditary disorders of connective tissue are at increased risk of developing the autoimmune disorders of, in general. Um, and there are a number of theories about why that may be. But um, it's, it's got to be a small percentage you know, of patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome overall who have these, these phenomena. Yeah, I suppose I was, uh, yeah. I was talking about dystonias and um, I wouldn't want anyone to leave thinking that all dystonias are due to perineoplastic lumbar and stuff like that. That would be a mistake. Uh, but that's just something that's been written about and in the literature and is, you know, very much validated with, you know, very good science. A lot of the other dystonias is not much written about, and as Dr. Austin said, uh, you know, if you go to another hospital, they'll think that you're faking the seizures, you know, and uh, we had a... Well, Imagine this, you eat a burger or whatever, you have three days of diarrhea, and then you start moving. Nobody ever thinks they are related. Yeah. But they are. Do you think vaccines, live vaccines, can induce any of this? I, I didn't read that in any <laughs> literature. <laughs> Peter, Dr. Rowe? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Even that famous study with the uh, MMR vaccine was actually a fake. Yeah, well, there was actually all the all the guys that signed that they pulled out, and then I ended up in a trial. That that we have a follow up, but not because we don't believe it. And uh, 1,300 kids died of uh, mumps in America or measles. That was really a financial interest, and he was paid by the family of of kids to do that. And everything came public uh, probably five years ago. So. Well, what if you have something autoimmune going on and then you vaccinate? Do you think that can be exasperated? Or? Well, people that are on immunosuppression, they should not get like <coughs> definitely. And they are all, um, you know, educated and instructed not to do that. Yes. Um, you indicated that you believe the acetylcholine is uh, responsible for the EPS. Do you, is it a matter of um, excessive production or poor metabolization of it? It's, it's, yeah, is, is it, is it, what, how does it fit in the um, well, scheme think, of things? I are think there receptors that are not yeah, picking? I think there's too point? much. Too much. Okay. Too much. So um, then we, when we give benzotropin, which is a long acting natural thing, mm -hmm. um, that blocks the effect of that excessive acetylcholine mm -hmm. in the body. Okay. And that's a mechanism in Parkinson's too. Mm -hmm. You have too much acetylcholine and too little dopamine. Mm -hmm. There is a, uh, 
subtype of dystonias called dopamine sensitive dystonias that makes us in the future try to get a bit of cinnamon, which is a dopamine, when we have them to see what happens. This is how you diagnose them, kind of post factum. You give that, and if it works, that's the diagnosis. If not, no. try something else. Um, they are, there's something called beta stimulation to stop the dystonia, and it also works on acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we definitely have a few uh, information there, a bit of data to make us think that this work. And we have we had good success by giving a simple chronic pain medication, um, amitriptyline, which is an old antidepressant that has a side effect of you know dry mouth and all of these atropinic side effects that helps a lot with movement. Um, one of our patients had a major dystonic movement that some people even called it seizure. I gave her on, on the spot a, 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 a shot of one milligram of benzotropin of a um, cogentin IV, and he stopped the movement immediately. So that pretty much confirmed to me that it's something to that. Um, there's another subject that I didn't even a, 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 a approach about the um, There's a degree of adrenal insufficiency that will come sooner or later in the EDS picture. And um, this is very hard to understand for regular, uh, how to say, for regular medicine, how do we treat that? Because sometimes you will have an exacerbation, sometimes you will need surgery. You cannot go down with the dose, we'll go up with the dose, and then uh, uh, endocrinologists will say that uh, actually you took too much too many, uh, too much uh, uh, prednisone back in time, and this is just a side effect of that, is a drug induced one. I don't think so. I think at one moment this adrenal function will come into play, and we do hear many times the morning cortisol that we expect to be somewhere between 4 and 20. And the last time that I checked that in EDS was 0.8. Um, that's not enough to diagnose it. You have to do a stimulation test, to do an ACTH, the hormone that the body makes, to see if it comes up. If it comes up, that's okay. It's just low at the base, but it's working, it's stimulated. But we have cases that nothing happened after that. So those people have to be, for the rest of their lives, on a steroid dose in the morning and in the afternoon. Also, low blood pressure many times and uh, we try to stimulate that with a bit of fludrocortisone. It also had a side effect on the long run, fluid retention like the steroids and so on. But overall, I think our patients are better off with those two medications than without. A lot of things that you have to walk a very fine line and um, trying to do it. You don't see patients right outside of the hospital. Or no, they are. no. So some of us that are going through maybe being diagnosed with some of the pain and stuff or the long stuff with my daughter and stuff like that. Um, who, like, who do you refer to? I know we've seen Dr. Henderson surgically. Yeah. Uh, we well, see Dr. Frank yeah, Beth, Beth Latimer uh, sees uh, Henderson's yeah. patients, and uh, okay. yeah, and she's uh, she. Said she'd like to give a talk at this forum. Okay. So, Dr. Lemmer, we see her, and she believes in the molecular labs for the testing. Are you familiar with molecular labs? It's so called the Cunningham panel. Right. Um, There's a woman named Madeline Cunningham. She's like a researcher for strep. Um, and um, she had isolated these autoantibodies, I think there are like five receptors, it tests four for pandas. I think there's been a study on it, but there, I, don't, I think that's it as far as the research. But she relies heavily on results. <coughs> and, and the treatment changes function of the which of the five you have? Yeah, I think the receptors are the dopamine D1 
D2 receptor like anglicide, uh, CAM kinase 2 or something, and then um, and to tubulin. So I don't know. It has something to do with Sandham's Korea or something. But I don't know. I think you're going <coughs> to skip college and maybe skip the first few years of medical school there. <laughs> All right, any other? Uh, yes? Um, Phytophoresis, the usual, is five procedures, but if you see um, improvement in, in dystonia and whatever the symptoms are, can you continue for another round? Or how do you decide that? I've heard you go like just two rounds and then, you know, is it yeah. It's, it's recommended that you repeat it again, okay. as Dr. Austin was saying. Yeah, and then six numbers. weeks later, you do it again. And six weeks later, you, you do it again. Well, this time, the, the five session comes by the idea that uh, one session of plasma for this, well, it depends how you do it. As roughly, for somebody that's, um, let's say um, 80 kilos, right, what's that? 175 pounds, pretty much. Um, the plasma is, the blood is 7% of the body, and the plasma is about 60% of that, the 40% is the red blood cells, like mammogram. So that, if you make a calculation, will be like 3.2 liters of plasma right. you have in your body. We, uh, we can remove all of that in a single session of plasma phoresis, or 1.4 times that. It depends how uh, uh, how much the submachine <laughs> if you have a, a, a heavier patients, then uh, you do once only. Change. I mean, only one yeah. time. So I do plasma phoresis. So okay. So you take out 3.2 yeah. liters of plasma, and you put usually albumin, right, right. instead. One procedure like this removes about 75% of circulation uh, in the body, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. So the rest 25, 75 of that, and again and again, so pretty much five sessions clear more than 90 something percent of. So this is how we came up with the numbers. Um, if they are different antibody IgM, only those are bound, some of them, they are bound more to um, they're less intravascular and more into organs, you know, like spleen, lymph nodes, and so on. Those only 45% you remove in a, in a single session. So those will need more. There's some literature saying that actually you should measure the IgG and IgM level before and after. And uh, we never did that. And if the number is below 500, I don't know what's the measuring unit, units or milligrams per something. Yeah. Then you then you should say I'm good and I stop here. We never did it. We always went with four or five sessions. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Um, it, so my son will be 25 in just a couple months, and it's so odd to me that the pandas thing is up on the radar now. So when he was eight, so it was in 1998, he developed a complicated tick movement disorder. Luckily, just seeing all the drama, got into a neuro, uh, pediatric neurologist who said, and I said to him, you know, the odd thing was, I put him, he has a science infection, he was on antibiotics, on a for six weeks, and his ticks like almost disappeared, and now they're like back, and he said, no, I don't think that's weird, I think he has pandas. So at the time, I don't know what was known, and I had really very little interest in medicine, and so I just did what they told me to do, which was put him on, um, anytime he started to take again, he went on a low dose of amoxicillin, and he got strep or any kind of sickness, he went right onto a bigger dose. And I continued through probably to around 16, 17. And so now I'm thinking, so I was just telling these nice ladies over here that you know he's thriving, doing really well, which he is, except, he developed some compulsive disorder type stuff around 17, 18. It still is kind of there, and it's kind of morphed now actually into a weird sugar addiction. He just can't get rid of. So, what do you think of all that? And like, any thoughts? 
yeah, what, did you check the ASO titers and all of those recently? No, not recently. So like we had just thought when he was here, like he had outgrown it. But now I'm starting to think, mm, I don't think so. Did he have any pharyngitis or something like that, upper respiratory infection things? Did you see any relationship with being sick and having a cold and then being more OCD, eating more sugar in oh, this case? Um, so the last four years he's not lived with me, luckily. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but um, before that, yes, we definitely would see. Um, uh, we definitely would see things, and then unfortunately, I was very sick in from 2006 with a kayaking accident that exacerbated all my issues. So um, I wasn't the best parent for a few years, so I couldn't really tell you during that period. But before that, absolutely. I noticed the ticking with and with the OCD stuff though I can't make that connection just because I was not as involved as I mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. could have been. Well you you have that checked and if you find numbers higher than two hundred and we saw six hundred, seven hundred here, then definitely then definitely he has the antibodies in the bloodstream and they attack they attack structures in the basal ganglia in the head. So then a plasmapheresis should work on him. So, so his primary care doctor can run these tests? You have to tell him what to write, folks. He should <laughs> tell him what to write. <laughs> 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 you say that that's and then I have one other, one other quick question. So my dad is a physician, brilliant physician. He got sick a few years ago and developed a weird tremor and he's been trying like crazy to find out. He's always asking to do research for him. And I, I can't even come up with, you know, it's a dead end. Now Was I'm that after an infection? Yeah, he did have an infection. He actually had a giardia proven, and then he had something else that they don't know. So now I'm thinking, hmm, maybe he should give you a call. Yeah. And I'm thinking now, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this really makes sense because he's been to Mayo. Nobody can find out what's caused this. Yeah. And how does the glucose or glucose play into all that? Mm, I don't think into pandas, more like in the EDS. Mm -hmm. Into the EDS. Uh -huh. okay. I have a question. Why is this so controversial? My, our pediatrician will not run the strep titers. Um, he is very resistant. Because, because it's something that's not, that tendency and um, that probably will be edited out of the footage. Sorry. The, <laughs> the tendency in the American medicine, I'm taking, I'm talking as a guy uh, schooled in Europe and practiced medicine there, yeah. is that we now are into something called evidence-based practice. Evidence-based practice is that you take a disease that you know has a hundred of treatments, yeah. and you've been doing it for many years, and now you just go through them and see which one works in more people. So this is kind of a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. These new diseases, we don't have anything about them. So they are not evidence-based medicine. So everywhere you go, all the meetings I go, they only talk about evidence-based. Nursing, only evidence-based. So uh, this is not something that's evidence-based. And a lot of people um, smile and look at you like you're an idiot. But there are other new diseases in the same category, like. Uh, chronic Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome. They look at that doesn't exist. Something like this doesn't exist. Yes, it does. Because there are people that are completely incapacitated by chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. And that's why people are resistant. Because they didn't talk about that. They didn't learn about any med school. And mainstream uh, journals don't quite publish that. If I want to do a study on pandas and I'm going to publish it, probably I'll be, uh, I'll find a slot in, um, in a pediatric uh, psychiatry journal and not in Journal of, journal of American right. Medical Association, yeah. you know? We have a psychiatrist in our team who is supportive, but in our pediatrician has a psychiatrist. He, yeah. Yeah, he's resistant. So then. That's why, well, that's why I hear from so many parents of, 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 of kids that have, or, or, or patients that have. Then I went and I presented all the evidence, and my doctor told me, oh, that's internet stuff. <laughs> so, insist. Try somewhere else. What can I say? Yeah.
should open the practice. Mm. Well, probably we'll open something together. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My son is 14, and since he was little, he was always like, I think I have my answer to this question. He's had bouts of OCD and tics, and it goes away, and it comes back. So it's probably this. It, it comes away in winter and in spring, more most likely is that. Wow. Because our people that advocate prophylaxis, and I'm one of them, is to do it in the months that you're most likely to get that, mm -hmm. that pharyngitis. Because probably you won't get it in uh, July and August, so probably then you won't have to take that um, Zitromax or Nantin <coughs> prophylaxis daily. Yeah. His OCD gets so bad, you know, that at times over the years I'll say, you have to stop doing that because people are going to think you're weird, you know, like just socially. But he cannot control it because right, he doesn't do it because he wants to. Right. He doesn't but then really it will want attention on those people. It's bizarre and it's gone. Mm -hmm. Then it comes back. Go on the internet and look at this Y box scale. Okay. Y B O C S even has an uh, uh, um, article on Wikipedia, and then you can download the scale. And uh, it takes half an hour to give it to him. He can rank himself then, and send me an email with the score, and send me an email with the um, Aslo titer. I'm, I'm going to tell you what to do. Okay. Do you want to give them your yeah, the email address? Yeah, the email address is dr. Austin. Period. Yahoo. Dot com. Send. Send me an email. Yeah. 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 Yeah.